All right, this is our lecture video on the muscular system, and we're going to start off by watching this brief video introduction. Walking. A highly coordinated series of falls that we've taken for granted since we were toddlers. Requires no fewer than 200 skeletal muscles. Back muscles to keep you from falling forward. Abdominal muscles to keep you from falling back. It takes 40 or so muscles just to raise one leg and move it forward. Okay. We're simply making dinner plans and picking up groceries. The whole thing would be absolutely useless without an infrastructure. As our day pushes on, these skeletal muscles lift us through it, usually without our thinking about it. Without them, we couldn't run. Or blink, smile, or speak for that matter. Hello? Just muttering a single Hello? word. Hello? 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 Involves muscles in the face, lips, tongue, jaw, larynx. As many as a hundred muscles. All right, so we are going to start off with some microscopic. Um, information regarding the muscular system and then we'll move into whole muscle. So what is the function of the muscular system? The obvious one, movement, right? Helps, attaches to our bones, gets us throughout our day. Brought you to class today. Maintenance of posture. So we know that if you have strong muscles, you tend to stand a little more upright. People with weaker muscles tend to have kind of poor posture. So um, maintaining posture. Respiration, what muscle, what skeletal muscle that's not under voluntary control is in charge of respiration? The diaphragm, yep, the diaphragm. They sit, it sits right underneath the lungs and the medulla has neurons. And do you remember what the name of the neuron is that synapses on the diaphragm? We studied that last week in lab when we studied the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. Phrenic, yeah, and you can remember that PHR for phrenic and diaphragm PHR. So the phrenic nerves coming off the medulla come down and synapse on the diaphragm and allow us to breathe. So if people have spinal cord injury in the neck where that phrenic nerve, before that phrenic nerve comes down, then they can end up with not having the ability to breathe on their own and they need a machine to stimulate that diaphragm. So respiration. And another one that may not be obvious is production of body heat. Um, our muscle cells are highly metabolic, so they're a living cell, they're long cylindrical cells with multiple nuclei, so they are what are undergoing metabolism and most of the energy from glucose is lost as heat as we're burning it and turning it into ATP in our cells. That heat that we give off from our muscle cells and other metabolic processes, but there's a lot of muscle cells actively contracting and working. Um, a lot of that 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is from muscle cells. And what do we know about people that want to lose weight and boost their, uh, boost their metabolism? What do we tell them to do? When, you, when it comes to muscle, what do they say? Even more than getting on a treadmill for 45 minutes, some people recommend Weightlifting, yeah, bodybuilding. And not bodybuilding like you're huge, but just toning, right? Building muscle. When we build muscle, that boosts our metabolism. So when a person is muscular, sits next to a person that's not muscular, just sitting there, that muscular person is burning more calories per minute sitting there in class than the person who has less muscle mass. So that's a good way to, to boost metabolism and a, a reason for body heat. And what happens when we're using our muscles during exercise? Does body temperature go up pretty quickly? Yeah. So that's why like in a nursing home when the temperature is 80 degrees on the thermostat, right, and all the elderly are sitting in their chairs not moving much and you're moving around helping take care of them, you get pretty hot pretty fast, don't you, because you're using all that muscle. Or sometimes you're sitting, you know, down doing homework and you're not moving so you might put an extra sweater on in the winter time and then you get up and do a little housework and it's like, oh my gosh, right, you got to take off your sweater. Well, that's, you know, body heat from that muscle contraction. Communication, muscle cells communicate with one another. So we look at um, the spread of an action potential throughout a muscle is as the nervous system communicates with the muscular system to get it to contract. 
and also other muscle cells can communicate with other muscle cells. And we see that in particular with the heart. There's gap junctions that allow sodium that's causing an action potential in one cell to flow through an open door to a nearby cell through a gap junction, allowing that cell to have an action potential without individual stimulation by a motor neuron. So they can communicate that action potential through those gap junctions. We'll get more into that when we get into the muscular system of the heart. And then constriction of organs and vessels. What type of muscle causes that? We had three choices, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, or cardiac muscle. Which one contracts the bladder, contracts the stomach, moves food along? Smooth muscle, yep, and that's not under voluntary control, right? So smooth muscle is what controls blood pressure, so our blood vessels have smooth muscle that, is, that controls the diameter of those blood vessels. So when smooth muscle contracts, that constricts the blood vessel. And what would happen to blood pressure if we make that vessel smaller? It'll go up, we'll have high blood pressure. And when the blood vessel dilates, we have lower blood pressure, right? So um, we know that headaches can be caused by blood pressure and vessel diameter you know, serving the skull, right, or serving the, the, the brain, and that causes some people to be more prone to headaches and, and um, um, migraines, right? So what are some things that dilate blood vessels that people take in? Maybe some of you have it in your mugs around the room today. I see a kickstart there. <laughs> Caffeine. Caffeine dilates blood vessels. So when people have a headache, like my kids, someone's got a bad headache, we don't have any ibuprofen around, I'll buy them a Mountain Dew because caffeine helps headaches. But it can also cause headaches if you are addicted to caffeine. So it's kind of a catch-22, isn't it? But um, and caffeine is also a good bronchodilator. People where they're having an asthma attack, if there's nothing else around. I had a boyfriend years ago that had bad asthma, and if there was nothing else around to help, he didn't have his um, inhaler, he would drink caffeine, have a cup of coffee, and that would help his asthma. So those are little tips and tricks. Um, and then heartbeat, obviously that's cardiac muscle, right, that causes the heart to beat. That's contraction of the heart causing the valves to open and then slam shut and that slam, slamming shut of the heart valves when the heart relaxes, that's the, the heartbeat that we hear through our stethoscope. So this picture is also something I showed in lab, so I'm not going to go into great detail here because I talked about it in the lab video. But on the left, we see skeletal muscle. This is what we're going to talk about in terms of physiology. We're going to spend a lot of time on the physiology of skeletal muscle. And then when you get into advanced A&P, we'll hit the cardiac muscle and smooth muscle a little more in a little more detail. But for right now, we want you really to focus on how, does, how do those skeletal muscles contract and how do they work. So notice they are long cylindrical cells, and they have multiple nuclei. So when we talk about a muscle cell, another name for it is muscle fiber. So sometimes when you think of fibers, you think of like connective tissue, right? Well, in the case of the muscular system, we call a muscle cell a muscle fiber. So kind of keep those two terms interchangeable in your mind. And just like in the uh, nervous system, what did we call a nerve cell? A neuron. Not a nerve, right? A nerve is different than a neuron, and that'll definitely be on the test. So know the difference of that you know, for the nervous system. But for the muscular system, it's muscle fiber or muscle cell, one and the same. So looking at these skeletal muscle cells, they're long cylindrical cells with multiple nuclei. So this is so looking at this you know diagram here, there are three muscle cells shown here, and the thought is is those multiple nuclei. How did that happen? The thought is is that during development, during fetal development, our, our thought is is that muscle cells fuse together, and they were individual with one nucleus, but then they fuse together, and that's why they have multiple nuclei. That's the thought. But just like fat cells, skeletal muscle cells, once puberty is complete, we can't get more skeletal muscle cells. All we can do is increase their size, right? Increase their diameter by building up the components inside those muscle cells. We cannot increase the number of muscle cells. So that's really important to when you're done growing after puberty, yeah, yeah. So we know mitosis occurs throughout the growth period in humans, but then once we're all done growing, that's it. The fat cells you have on board, the muscle cells you have on board, and those things are not gonna change. Same thing with neurons, right? We know that neurons don't increase in number after development is complete. 
very low mitotic ability. So again, numbers remain constant. It's bolded and underlined, so make sure you remember that. And then this striped appearance, this, these vertical lines that run up and down in the muscle cell here, we call those striations. And that's due to tiny little proteins that make up the muscle cell that are really important for muscle contraction. And those proteins are called myosin and actin. We'll talk about those in a lot of detail here in a little bit. So properties of a muscle cell. Muscle cells are unique in that they contract. They're the only cells in the body that can shorten and then relax and turn back to their original length. So they shorten and then they relax and go back to their, their length their original length. But smooth muscle cells can actually um, shorten and then they can relax and have a new resting length, like the stomach. If we know that if we stretch the stomach by eating large amounts of food, um, heavy meals, like you're really, really hungry. I remember doing this in college. I'm going to go on a diet because all that cafeteria food in the dorms, you know, I gained a lot of weight in my first year there. So I thought, well, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm not going to eat anything for breakfast or lunch. Is that smart? No. So then what happened when I came home at 3 o'clock after classes? I was ready to eat a huge amount of food, and I did. I'd order a big pizza, a medium pizza from Pizza Pit, and I would sit there and eat the whole thing. So what does that do to my stomach then? <laughs> Stretch it out. And if you keep doing that, your stomach stays stretched. And then when the stomach starts to shrink a little bit, it says, hungry, 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 right? When your stomach is, is not at its resting length, it tells you you're hungry. So when we eat large amounts of food, we Get, we get on this cycle of being hungry, hungry every time it goes back, you know, um, smaller than its resting length. So the, so the stomach has the ability to develop a new resting length. Muscle cells have a pretty standard resting length. So something to keep in mind. We always talk about our bodies are like a furnace. We want to keep the furnace going, right? You don't put a bunch of wood in the furnace. Let's say you have a wood burner, right? You don't put a bunch of wood in the furnace, like eating a large breakfast, and then let the furnace go empty, right? And then come in at nighttime and fill it full again and then let it go down to nothing. Our metabolism needs constant fuel. So small amounts of food throughout the day. They say, how many meals should you eat a day? Have you heard? Yeah, it, there's a little variability, but sometimes even say six to eight, you know, just little bits. And, it, and a meal doesn't have to be a meal, right? It can be a snack, like an apple, granola bar, peanut butter sandwich. The best, cheapest way to fend off the golden arch calling your name when you're driving home from class or from work, which is what happens to me, Taco John's calls me as I drive by it at 11.30 at night after a night, an evening shift. The best thing to do is to keep that furnace full, then you won't be looking for those things, right? So, or not full, but at least working on something. And the best, cheapest um, college student snack to keep in your bag that's not going to go bad is a peanut butter sandwich because peanut butter stabilizes the blood sugar. And you'd probably know about that because diabetics, we want you to have protein with a little bit of sugar, not sugar, sugar, but healthy carbs, like on a whole wheat bread. Throw it in your backpack. It's cheap. It's easy to make. You can make it the night before, and it's going to stave off those crazing and cravings and prevent that stretching of overeating when we go too long without food. And being a college student, you can definitely go too long without food when you have back-to-back -to -back classes, right? So back to this then. Um, excitability just means it has a resting membrane potential that can change. So we can open up channels on a muscle cell membrane, change the resting potential, and fire off an action potential in the membrane of that muscle cell. So we know that nerve cells and muscle cells are excitable. Remember, we talked about that in the nervous system. They're the only two cells with excitable membranes. All cells have a resting membrane potential, but nervous and muscle, can, we can change that resting membrane potential. So they're excitable. Extensible, we already talked about that. Um, elasticity means it, once I stretch it, it will bounce back to its resting length. Again, with the exception of smooth muscle, it can have a new resting length. So that's important that I can stretch my arm out straight and then once I relax it again, it has a kind of a slightly bent appearance, right? Because that's the resting length. I can go beyond the resting length. And that's important when we're lifting objects, and we'll talk more about that. So looking at a muscle, we talked about this in lab, so I'm not going to go into great detail again. Just remember, if this is a whole muscle, so this here would be like a roast you'd find at the grocery store. You'll see kind of a shiny white membrane on the outside. And inside of that are a bunch of muscle cells. So these are 
muscle cells. This is one individual muscle cell here. I'm sorry, right here. You can see the multiple nuclei. So they're bundled together into what we call fascicles. Where do we see the word fascicle before? Do you remember? Yeah, very good. In our nerves, our nerves are bundles of axons. So a nerve is a bundle of individual nerve cells, just the axon portion. A muscle, a whole muscle like we see here, is a bundle of muscle cells bound up into little fascicles. So a fascicle is a connective tissue wrapping around a bundle of muscle cells. So think of if you have like a toilet paper tube, you fill it with a bunch of spaghetti noodles, and I have this in my office, I should bring it next time we meet. Um, toilet paper tube, fill it with a bunch of uncooked spaghetti noodles, and get 10 of those toilet paper tubes filled with spaghetti noodles, and that's one muscle. So each toilet paper tube represents a fascicle, and each spaghetti noodle represents a muscle cell, muscle cell. So they're bundles of these muscle cells. And if I look at a muscle cell, which I said to remember is also called a muscle fiber, if I look at one, it has little tiny units inside of it. And we talked about this in lab. These are called myofibrils, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So if we look at a whole muscle, here we can see another diagram, another view of that. So here's my connective tissue outer wrapping. And in these, here's a fascicle, here's another fascicle, here's another fascicle, here's my muscle fiber, here's one. So how many muscle fibers are in this fascicle? Nine. nine. Yep, so there's nine muscle cells in this fascicle. Notice there's blood vessels running in that fascicle. Notice the blood vessels wrapping around the fascicle. Notice the motor neurons that are coming through. And notice how one motor neuron has axon terminals that serve a number of muscle fibers. Do you agree with that, that there's one motor neuron, those axon terminal branches serve more than one muscle cell? Yes. We'll talk about that concept a little later as well. But would everybody agree that the muscular system has a good blood supply? Yep. Does it have a good nervous supply? Yes. So can muscles be repaired quickly to a point? The biggest problem happens with people that damage their muscle. It's not the muscle that is injured as much as when they overstretch the muscle or contract it too hard, they damage the tendon, right? And, what, and does the tendon have a good blood supply? Nope. So what happens then is you have damage there. The muscle is injured because of damage to the tendon. So it takes a long time sometimes to heal a really severely damaged tendon. And the muscle is not going to function properly because it's not attached the way it should be. Okay, so we talked about um, the muscle being excitable. So when muscles are excitable, it means that they have a neuron that stimulates it. We also talked about this in lab, but we're going to revisit it here. This is called the neuromuscular junction. And we're going to watch an animation of what happens here to get this muscle cell. So here's the muscle cell. The gray is the muscle cell membrane right below the motor neuron axon terminal that's right near it, that's you know, controlling it. So we're just looking at this, whoop, we're zeroing in on this relationship right here. So you see that little axon terminal that's in close proximity to this muscle cell membrane? So we're zeroing in on that and looking at the details. So the first thing that has to happen is we have to have an action potential in that motor neuron. And that can happen starting in the, in the motor cortex of the brain. You say, oh, I want to pick up my pencil. But you don't consciously say that, right? It's a thought. It goes down the spinal cord, out the nerve, right? Out the ventral root, out that spinal nerve, and it branches into this one axon terminal. That action potential comes down. As it comes down the membrane, it opens up voltage-gated calcium channels. So every step is numbered here. Opens up voltage-gated calcium channels. We always see calcium in higher concentration outside the cell compared to inside the cell because we bring in calcium in through our diet. And if the doors are closed to calcium, there's going to be more calcium outside our cells than inside. We have special channels to allow it in. So this voltage-gated channel opens up. Calcium flows in. And the flow of calcium, we're not going to analyze why it happens if we took a a molecular biology class or a biochemistry, more molecular biology, we would study why that changes the motor neuron. 
but we're just going to take it at face value. If calcium flows into the cell, it causes these little vesicles that contain acetylcholine. It causes those vesicles to come to the end of the axon terminal and by exocytosis dump that acetylcholine into the space between the motor neuron and the muscle cell membrane. So that's a requirement. If calcium is not there to do that, then this acetylcholine is not stimulated to be released. So calcium comes in, acetylcholine is dumped out, it diffuses across the membrane and binds to special channels on the muscle cell membrane. What type of channel is this if it requires acetylcholine to bind to it? We talked about leak channels, voltage-gated channels, and what was that other channel? Yeah, ligand-gated channels. And ligand is just a fancy word for any chemical that has to bind to a channel to get it to open. So this is a ligand-gated or chemically-gated channel on the muscle cell membrane that when acetylcholine binds, it opens up a door. And remember, this is outside the cell. This whole area here is interstitial fluid, right? Because this is one membrane of a cell. This is the other membrane of a cell. So the space between them is outside the cell. We know that what ion, important to action potentials, is found in greater concentration outside the cell? Sodium. So when acetylcholine binds, it opens up a door and sodium flows in. And if we get enough sodium to flow in for that muscle cell to reach negative 55, which we call threshold, what do we get in that muscle cell? An action potential. So that's what's required. So let's just watch this animation here. An action potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal. Gated calcium ion channels Sorry. and potential arrives at the presynaptic terminal, causing voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open, increasing the calcium ion permeability of the presynaptic terminal cell membrane. Calcium ions enter the presynaptic terminal and cause vesicles to release their neurotransmitter acetylcholine from the synaptic vesicles into the presynaptic cleft. Diffusion of acetylcholine across the synaptic cleft and binding of acetylcholine to acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic muscle fiber membrane causes an increase in the permeability of ligand-gated sodium ion channels. The movement of sodium ions into the muscle cell results in depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane. Once threshold has been reached, a postsynaptic action potential is generated and is propagated over the muscle cell membrane. Acetylcholine is rapidly broken down to acetic acid and choline in the synaptic cleft by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. The choline is reabsorbed by the presynaptic terminal and combined with acetic acid to form more acetylcholine, which enters the synaptic vesicles. Okay, so there's an enzyme that has to break down acetylcholine in order to shut this door, right? Because we don't want a continuous action potential in our muscles, otherwise we'd be contracted and we'd never relax. And there's actually um, some physiology and unfortunately some, some warfare chemicals that have been used that influence the neuromuscular junction. Um, for example, sarin gas was something used over in the Middle East by Saddam Hussein to, you know, kill his people. And it interfered with acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction. And if we're talking about the diaphragm, if the diaphragm can't relax, what happens? You suffocate, yeah. You're gonna take a deep breath as it contracts, right? <gasps> and then you're stuck. And you cannot exhale and you die from that. So um, it's what's used in poison arrow um, darts in tribes, you know, over in Africa. And um, there's a disease called myasthenia gravis that um, causes dysfunction of the neuromuscular junction, resulting in muscle weakness. So we give patients with that disease an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So we try to inhibit, inhibit that enzyme from breaking down acetylcholine so we can increase the strength of contraction for those patients that are getting weaker and weaker from destruction of the neuromuscular junction function. So what happens once we get that action potential at the surface? We already looked backward a little bit and we saw that the muscle cell 
you know, has these little fibers here down deep in the muscle cell. If we have an action potential on the surface here, we need to get that down deep to get all these myofibrils working. So to do that, there's another structure which is called a T-tubule. A T-tubule is a piping network that brings the action potential down deep into the muscle fiber. And here's the myofibril right here, this red structure. All of this is part of the myofibril. So that action potential comes down in down the T-tubule, and there's voltage-sensitive calcium proteins here that interact with a special smooth ER. There's a smooth ER that wraps around muscle cells like a crochet sweater, like a really, you know, like a kind of a big holes in the sweater, or maybe if you think of like a, a blanket or a scarf you might have that was crocheted, there's really big holes in it. That's kind of what the this special smooth ER is in muscle cells. It's shown in blue, it's, um, but it has these sacs right next to a T-tubule that store additional calcium. So we have calcium stored in this special smooth ER. And the name of this smooth ER is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that blue structure there that stores those little red calcium ions is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sometimes we talk about it just calling it the SR, but it's a special smooth endoplasmic reticulum unique to muscle cells that stores calcium. So when the action potential comes down that T-tubule, it opens up those voltage-gated calcium channels and releases extra calcium inside that muscle cell. So let's take a look at this animation. Typically, a single motor neuron arising in the brain or spinal cord conducts action potentials that travel to hundreds of skeletal muscle fibers within a muscle. The sequence of events that converts action potentials in a muscle fiber to a contraction is known as excitation-contraction coupling. If we look at a single muscle fiber, we see that an action potential travels across the entire sarcolemma. Okay, so the sarcolemma is what's shown in yellow here. At the surface, this is the surface of the muscle cell. Notice there's these little indentations, these little piping networks, and it's extensions of the sarcolemma that bring that action potential down deep into the muscle fiber. What did we say these were called again? T-tubules, T-tubules. So then wrapped around each myofibril, each little cylindrical unit inside the muscle cell is this purple-blue structure, which is called what again? Yes, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that is, again, looks kind of like a crocheted blanket, sweater, or scarf wrapped around the inside myofibrils of this muscle cell. And is rapidly conducted into the interior of the muscle fiber by structures called transverse tubules. Transverse, or T-tubules, are regularly spaced in foldings of the sarcolemma that branch extensively throughout the muscle fiber. At numerous junctions, the T-tubules make contact with a calcium-storing membranous network known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum. What are the little purple fl things floating around in the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum? What are those little pink things? Do you remember? Calcium ions, yep, calcium ions. So remember, the job of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR, is to store excess calcium. And then again, the, the, the yellow is the plasma membrane. There's a fancy name for the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. It's called the sarcolemma. So sarcolemma is another name for plasma membrane. Or SR. Where it abuts the T-tubule, the SR forms sac-like bulges called terminal cisternae. One portion of a T-tubule plus two adjacent terminal cisternae is known as a triad. The membranes of the T-tubule and terminal cisternae are linked by a series of proteins that control calcium release. As an action potential travels down the T-tubule, it causes a voltage-sensitive protein to change shape. 
This shape change opens a calcium release channel in the SR, allowing calcium ions to flood the sarcoplasm. This rapid influx of calcium triggers a contraction of the skeletal muscle fiber. Thus, calcium ions are responsible for the coupling of excitation to the contraction of skeletal muscle fibers. So, we can see that calcium plays an important role in muscle contraction, right? So we need calcium in our diet to support muscle contraction. And what, in this whole body we have, what organ, what two organs does the body protect most? The heart and the, not even the lungs, brain. Yeah, the brain is the boss. So the brain is the last thing to go. When someone's dying, brain is the last to go. Vision goes, hearing is one of the last things to go. So should you be freaking out at the bedside or saying inappropriate things while someone's in the dying process? Never, never. Because there have been people that have been close to death and that have come back from it, rallied, and said, why did you say that? You know, when I was lying there, you were talking about who's going to take the house, you know. I'm still there. <laughs> so, and also stress, right? If a person is dying and they're fearful, but they can't move, and, you know, they're in the dying process, do we want to be crying and freaking out? You want to be as calm as possible, right? And respectful as, pro as possible, because sometimes you might be the only person there you know, and especially if it's not your family and it's a healthcare environment, you want to be really respectful and calm and, you know, all that. So anyway, calcium is very important. And this space, once it's released from the SR, it enters the sarcoplasm, which is another fancy name for cytoplasm of a muscle cell. Sarcoplasm, cytoplasm, same thing. So what happens to this calcium? Floats around the cytoplasm and um, diffuses around these contracting units inside the muscle cell, which is called actin and myosin. So do we have a little difference in our? Yeah, it's just a couple pages. Okay, we'll just go to this one then. So the first one, actin, is called the thin filament. So there's thick filaments and thin myofilaments inside a muscle cell. And there's three parts of actin that you need to know. There's tropomyosin, which is this rope-like structure that covers binding spots for calcium. There's troponin, which is this yellow structure that binds calcium. And then there's these actin subunits. There's G-actin and F-actin. The actin are the little circular units, kind of like a pearl necklace, right? So strand of pearl necklace. So when we look at individual subunits, we call that F-actin. I'm sorry, G-actin. So G-actin are the individual subunits. F-actin is a strand of G-actin. Does that make sense? So F-actin is the whole, st is the strand, G-actin, so that'd be like the necklace, we call F-actin. Each individual pearl in the necklace, we call G-actin. Make sense? Okay. So if I look at troponin then, there are three binding sites on troponin. One binds to one of the G-actins. We can see that. So it's bound to a G-actin. One binds to calcium if it flows and is available, if it's released from the SR. And another one binds to tropomyosin. So that troponin is a really important protein for getting muscles to contract. And if a muscle cell is damaged, like in a heart attack or in extreme physical exercise, when muscle cells are damaged, it dumps these proteins out into the bloodstream. And we, that's a test we do for patients that come in with heart attack symptoms. We draw what's called a troponin level because we're looking for signs of heart muscle damage. And if troponin levels are increasing over time, we know that there's heart muscle damage. If the troponin level is negative, then we know the heart muscle cells haven't died yet. They were just stressed. They were just causing chest pain and shortness of breath because they were stressed, but they didn't die yet. 
and that that's good news. I mean, chest pain in itself means that the muscle cells have converted to lactic acid fermentation because there's not enough oxygen coming in, so it's causing pain. But if that pain goes away because of death to those muscle cells, then we're going to see elevated troponin, and we're going to see heart function changes. So we don't want to see elevated troponin levels. That means there's some heart muscle cell damage. So actin, we call the thin filament, and I'll show you why that is. So again, what are the parts of an actin myofilament? There's the actin subunits, and then a string of them, G-actin, F-actin. Then there's the tropomyosin that covers the binding sites because there's a binding site on each G-actin for the other filament to attach to it, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So it's like the string? Yeah. Yep, it's like the rope. Um, the tropomyosin is, and that covers those binding sites. And then troponin is attached to the tropomyosin and to the G-actin and has a binding site for calcium that when calcium binds to that troponin, that signals tropomyosin to move out of the way and uncover those binding sites and allow the other myofilament to interact with it. So we'll look at that next. So this is the other myofilament. It has a head and a tail, and the head is what binds to the G-actin on the actin myofilament. And what myosin has for binding sites on it is one spot, well two, one for binding to actin, and the other is for ATP to bind to it, to cock the head, allow it to bind, and then pull actin inward so the muscle cell contracts. And I'll watch a video for that to make, so this hopefully makes sense. So you can see this is the thick filament. Can you see why it's so thick? Look at the diameter of it. And it has all these little heads on it that can bind actin and ATP to get the muscle to contract. So we'll watch this video here. During contraction of a muscle, calcium ions bind to troponin. This moves tropomyosin out of the way and uncovers binding sites for myosin on the actin myofilaments. ADP and phosphate are attached to the myosin head from the previous cycle of movement. The myosin heads attach to the exposed binding sites on the actin myofilaments to form cross bridges and the phosphate is released. Energy stored in the head of the myosin myofilament is used to move the head. This causes the actin myofilament to slide past the myosin myofilament. The ADP is released from the myosin head as it moves. The bond between actin and the myosin head is broken when an ATP molecule binds to the myosin head. The ATP is broken down to ADP and phosphate, releasing energy, which is stored in the myosin head and will be used later for movement. The head of the myosin molecule returns to its upright position and is ready to bind to actin again. If calcium ions are still present, the entire sequence is repeated. So what two things are required to get actin and myosin to interact? ATP and calcium. Calcium. And when we look at it, what, what stops the interaction? What is required for myosin to let go of actin and allow that muscle to eventually relax? Let's watch it right. Turn the audio off. Right here. So here they're interacting. Actin is being pulled toward the center of the myofibril. What happens now? Yep, ATP is required to release that myosin from actin. So as long as we contract, we're kind of stuck there until ATP comes and relaxes. So have you heard of rigor mortis before? When people are stiff um, shortly after death? That doesn't last for very long. Because once the muscle cells, so they all, so what happens is the calcium floods the cell, all the muscle cells contract, they're in a contracted position, and then um, as no more ATP is available, because there's no more oxygen available, right, to make ATP, then the muscle cells break down and they relax and then the body is limp again. 
And there was a murder recently, not recently, in the last five years, I think, five or six maybe, um, where a person who didn't know his physiology on the witness stand, the one who they think is the perpetrator of the murder, he said, oh, well, when I discovered him, I touched him, and he was stiff. And he said this happened when he touched him on a Sunday, and the person, according to you know, studies and um, the autopsy report, died on a Friday. Would he still have rigor mortis on a Sunday? No, impossible. So he kind of blew a hole in his alibi by saying that he felt stiff when he touched him. So rigor mortis is a temporary state that is then, you know, the body goes limp after that muscle cell breaks down. Okay, so back to our myosin. So now we're going to analyze. Well, I think this is a good place to stop. We'll pick up next time and talk about sarcomeres.